Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Welcome to Word Docs. I am your host for the next few minutes, Alex Vickery. How I am here with Amy T. Matthews Hello. and Sean. Uh, I don't know what you mean. L. And it, Sean L. <laughs> Williams. It's Llewellyn, isn't it? Sean oh, Llewellyn? You've got a good memory, I, yeah. Amy. <laughs> Fantastic. And Spread. we are going to talk today about uh, something that I'm well acquainted with, which is failure. Both now, professionally we, and personally. <laughs> personally. So that would now, be Sean, Sean, Llewellyn, Williams and Alex, the failure. Vickery <laughs> <laughs> How many more names do you need, Alex? Now, I was going to ask, are we on this topic because of your inability to be cast in The Lion King? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to get brought up again and again. Well, I, we were talking at uni a long time ago about failure. And I remember saying, I count failure as things that get close to happening and don't happen. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah I would too. But then Sean shook his head very sadly in the corner of the room and said, no, Alex, there are other forms of failure <laughs> and just left it hanging. <laughs> Well, and I, now's I, I our intend chance. to do that now too. Which makes me think, because I think my experience of failure, um, certainly in, in film world, is all of the rewrites, all of the excitement, all of the one pages, the one liners for the log line, all of this stuff, the development thing you get paid for to redraft something and they're giving you money. But then ultimately you get to a point where they go, oh no, shit, that's really expensive. And the whole thing hits a wall. That's my... That's my tale of failure. But I guess there is also a, a more a more public version of failure where something comes out there and you go, oh, I did do what I set out to do and I wish I hadn't. Or <laughs> I, 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 did, I did something close to what I att- intended to do. Or, or what is, who should we start or with? I did, or I did exactly what I intended to do, but now I can see that that was a dumb idea. <laughs> that was folly. It was folly it from was the beginning. Folly. That's okay, so right. I'm going to probe this, Sean. There's obviously oh. a story here, or a series of stories of, of projects. <laughs> Sorry, that... I paused there, waiting for you to probe. <laughs> 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 Sentences that I didn't think I'd hear. So, uh, yeah, I suppose has there ever been a, a, a story you've put out there and gone what with the, that you've reflected on and gone? I no longer feel that that represents me, or I no longer feel that. That's something I wanted to put out into the world. There's so many different kinds of failures, aren't there? Failure is such an important part of the creative process and uh, no doubt we'll touch on this throughout this podcast that uh, if you're not failing, you're not learning. I I, I couldn't even point at my greatest failure, but um, the one I always think of is a book called The Crooked Letter, which um, I was unable to get right. And I worked very hard on the first three chapters, but I knew something was going wrong in the first three chapters and I just couldn't put my finger on it. So I ended up sending the whole manuscript to my editor to say, something wrong in the first three chapters, I can't put my finger on it over to you and she read it and said you know I feel the same what are we going to do and I said well why don't we put it out to a manuscript assessment service so I did that and paid a very good friend of mine an extremely good manuscript assessor to read over the entire manuscript and he after a couple of months he came back and said you know it's it's it ends really well but there's something wrong in the first three chapters and I just can't put my finger on it so my uh, because I needed to eat and because the publishing (laughs) schedule needed to be met my editor and I decided we'd put it out even though we both knew there was something wrong with it and I feel that to this day that uh, do you know what it is no I still don't know what it is I I picked the book up a couple of years ago and thought well I'll just read it and maybe I can find it and the first chapter was good the second chapter's good something happens 
in the third chapter that just punches it. But, I mean, that didn't stop the book winning awards and mm. being optioned for TV and all this. In some ways, it's my most successful book, but it will always feel like a failure to me because what I didn't do, what I probably should have done was gone, okay, now I know what the book is about. I'll rewrite the whole thing again from scratch. That's maybe what I should have done to get over that problem in the first three so chapters. The, but the failure is really that you don't know what's wrong with it, is that you're failing to find the problem. Well, and I actually think there is something wrong with it. Uh, if it was just me feeling that way and everybody else was saying, yeah, 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 it's great. Uh, but given that an editor and a manuscript assessor both agree with me, I think there is actually something. Mm. And when it's people that you wrong. trust and they give you feedback like that and you go, damn, the, the whole thing's, the whole thing's um, they're right. No, you know, it's fine when someone you don't respect says something's bad, you go, well, it must be good. But when it's people you really trust, <laughs> people you really trust, you go, damn, they're on the money. And then not being able to find it, I think, is, is quite unusual. But then mm. also sometimes I think it's, it's an imperfect book that makes a good book. Like it's that. Yes. I think maybe if you fix it, maybe it'd be boring. Because I mm. have an unpublished book that I is one of my greatest regrets. It's so I, everyone would know I've only published one work of literary fiction under my name, and I couldn't get my second literary fiction published, and it kept doing the round. So the literary editor at a publishing house would say, "Oh, it's a little bit too commercial," and then send it to the commercial editor, and the commercial editor would go, "It's a little bit too literary for for commercial," and it kept doing the rounds for years, and everyone would like it. It, and I put it mm. in for prizes and they'd like it and they would just not be able to put their finger on what's wrong with it. And I actually don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think it's not a simple marketing thing. Mm. So it's never been published and I still think it's one of my best books. But I have yep. lots of unpublished books. So I'm sure you do too, Sean. Yeah, I've got five, but they're yeah. terrible. <laughs> I think, I think they're not of, like your book. Your book is good. Of, but <laughs> Two of mine are terrible. Two of my unpublished ones are terrible. But a, a failure that became good was my uh, Bound for Eden, which ended up being the first Western I published. Mm. I wrote that, oh, I don't know, a long time before I published it, maybe eight years before I published it. And no one was publishing Westerns. So I just got no, 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 no. So I put it in a drawer. And then years mm. later, I was pitching to a, a New York publisher. And they went, you know what I'm looking for is a Western? I think Westerns are coming back. And I was just like, funny you should say that because I have one in a drawer and then it got published. But yeah, so I think sometimes it's a failure for now, not a failure forever. A failure is just a success that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I think that timing thing is really interesting because I think that happens a lot where you have something, um, the play I'm just about to publish has been sitting in my drawer for almost about six years. And, yeah. and now the bizarre thing about it is it's just hit at a point where <laughs> it, it, it's basically come true. And you think, oh, I wish I had done that six years ago. Yeah. Um, so, th- so the timing thing is really, is really interesting that a piece of art, you know, whether it's a, a script or a, or a book or a painting or, or a piece of music uh, or whatever, uh, it might just need its moment. Hmm. Yeah, do you know what's interesting? Last episode, Sean said something about not really regretting any of his choices because they led him here. And I have to say, I don't regret anything I've published. There's some I wouldn't write now and I wouldn't publish now. And particularly I'm thinking, you know, politics have moved on, the politics Mm. of appropriation, gender politics. Mm. There's things I published a long time ago I wouldn't publish now. Yes. But if... If we're not just talking writing, I think I can think of some teaching fails where I, I cringe thinking about when I started out some really bad moments in my career where I <laughs> fell flat or it was it was just a struggle because oh, I don't yeah. know that I have them so much anymore. I think I'm I'm quite confident now and I've got uh, I've got enough experience now that when I hit a wall I know what to do. But in yes. the beginning, in the beginning, oh my god, I think about some of my classes and lectures and think, oh, really I- failed at that. I accidentally threw a book at a student once, but it was a complete Alex. accident. I was just I was just waving my hands and, and I was all excited and this book just flew out of my hands and it was a big book. It was a big <laughs> it was a heavy tome. And You're smacked, very strong too. I, but it must have. I just I don't know my own power, Sean. And it, and it flew out of my hand, smacked this girl on the head, and I was so <gasps> thankful that it was a particular student that I had a good rapport with who clearly saw that it was an accident and just kind of laughed and went, I've got you, Vickery Howe. <laughs> I've got whenever I, whenever I want any favours, I've got you. I think um, 
why did I start that story? What was I think? Oh, I think that the thing about failures is they can happen super quickly. Yeah. It can just be a moment of a loss of concentration or an accident. I think most of my regrets, if you want to call them that, have just been that kind of momentary, usually a one-liner that I just really regret. Mm. <laughs> I've got yeah. a big mouth, so I, I feel your pain. I'm prone to saying things then going, why did I say that? Yeah. I got now drunk and I, I savaged a film critic to his face one night at the pub. <laughs> and then I was I was kind of like, I, as it was happening, I was, I don't know if I was sobering up or I was just starting to see the world outside myself. So then <laughs> mid-monologue, <laughs> tried to steer it back to... <laughs> <laughs> something positive and it was it was well and truly over it was well and truly over do you think failures happen when we're unprepared or not in complete critical control of our faculties or or i guess there are different kinds of failures aren't there so there yeah. are failures where that are, a bit, are due to things completely outside our control because i've had so many of those books that have tanked all my books have tanked really um, that's not true that's not well, true the Star Wars books have done well but most of my books <laughs> you know I sell pretty well but I'm not I'm not I have um, a friend who released um, a novel so she was doing really well her, her like her first two novels did really well but then she released her third book right when Brisbane flooded and the oh. warehouse holding her book got flooded oh so, no so they'd done all the publicity but then the books couldn't get out to stores and she just oh. kind of missed the moment and it's just and I feel like that with with this coronavirus too like there are a lot of authors who are supposed to be launching their books now you know tours are cancelled launches are cancelled yeah. I've got well, a book out some, next month some... Lisa and I were going to have a joint book launch uh, it was going to be a huge affair we've done that before and they're such great fun but um, I don't know we might do it online but yes publishers well, on the one hand publishers will be doing well because ebook sales will be great Great. Yeah. Yes. One would assume, and I guess books can still be sold online and delivered online, but um, yep. bookshops, you know, just what Printers bookshops need. For. Printers as I well, know. like printing services. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, things like that. I, mean, I, I, you know, like a warehouse flooding. I had a friend who somehow erased his PhD. I still don't quite know how he oh. did it. And he did it in the act of backing up his files. This is a long time ago, so, you know, you didn't have the cloud and, and what have you. But in the act of, I think, trying to save something to a... Di- I'm not quite sure what he was doing or whether it was a USB or what it was. Because he used to overwrite floppy disks. Do you remember that? Yeah. That was quite yes. easy to do I back think then. that might have been. And then he, he tried to salvage it. And he was, a, he was a tech savvy guy. And at that point had to decide, do I just walk away or do I just go oh hard? with what I remember and he walked away and I don't I don't blame him for that. I once lost a draft. It wasn't much. It was like maybe three new scenes and mm. I don't know what I did, whether how I saved it or what happened, but I just lost. You know that moment where you're reading through and you're like, I swear there was a scene there. Mm. Like yeah. I know, and then you oh. keep going and you're like, oh, hold on, there was another one. And you know that feeling of like, oh, I, I nailed those too. So I have to go back feeling like I'm going to rewrite them, but they won't be as you're good. You're never going to re- – you can't even recreate a good email. Like, you know, if you lose an email and you try and recreate it, you go – no, no, you're being it. harsh on Amy here, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> the failures of technology, I mean, we're preserved, we're protected a little bit more than we used to be back in the day. Um, mm. and there are so many stories going back a long way of people losing their one typed copy of their, oh, God. their yeah. book on the well, train I don't even, or whatever. I don't even have an electronic copy of my first book now like because really? it was so long ago. Like... It would that would be on floppy disks, and I don't have anything that reads a floppy disk mm. anymore. So I think um, I'd have to type it out or get it from the publisher. Well, I, I took a um, I took apart a hard copy edition of my first published novel and had it scanned, had it OCR'd professionally, and then uh, re-edited it and re judiciously rewrote a couple of scenes that were a bit icky. And I, I keep meaning to put it up online as an ebook mm. now, but uh, yeah, I, I hated the thought of not having a a copy of it on my yes. computer. Yeah, so now I've got everything. Thank goodness. So a lot of these are technology-related issues. I, I when t- technology and hubris combine. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, I, I did. So I was submitting Witching Hour, the witch script I I've worked on for a long time. Sorry, I'll, I'll rewind. I'll start again. <laughs> All of the characters in Witching Hour have um, animal familiars. If you're watching Sabrina the Teenage Witch, basically, you know, it was that. They're, 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 you know, I watched that again with some envy. Uh, but all of the characters have had animal f- familiars. 
And the main uh, character, Kira, had an owl as her familiar. She was the air witch and she had this owl and she could see through the owl's eyes and it was lots of fun. Uh, And I decided at some point, oh, that's not very kind of Australian first. I I should have a magpie. So I'm going to (laughs) change this owl into a magpie. So, you know, late one night. We we do have owls here, you know. We do have owls and it was stupid. And I I think it's (laughs) it's still an owl in the final draft. It's an owl again. But but for a while I thought, no, I'm going to make it more of an iconic Australian bird. I'm going to make it a magpie. It's a piping shrike. (laughs) (laughs) They're vicious. Um, yeah. And so I did a find replace and just went every time the word owl appears, I'm going to replace it. With oh, no. Oh, no. So just, you know, no. stop and think about how often that happened. Oh. And I, I sent it off um, to, to oh, a producer no. who was luckily lovely about it and just went, yeah, so every time you have growling, it's grammagpiling. Grim- uh, there was awful. a whole bunch. There was a whole bunch. Do you know what um, I would love to see is someone who has like a cockatoo so familiar <laughs> <laughs> that loud shrieking. <laughs> it's a great idea. That's like a curse, isn't it? <laughs> we were Speaking at one point. We were looking for trained foxes at one point because we were going to we were going to film oh the scene. Gosh. And there are two trained foxes in this city who are who are oh. um, film ready. And I didn't care about anything else. I just wanted to work with the trained fox, but we didn't we didn't end up doing that. <laughs> Talking about owls remind me of one of my greatest misjudgments. And I don't know whether that's a failure or not. But um, yeah, it's, let's it's say a, it is. Oh, <laughs> the day failure, Sean so. was attacked by an owl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it reminds me of Harry Potter, and um, I forget the name of the editor who bought Harry Potter in England but he started up an imprint he got given an imprint because of all the money he'd made for the publishing company and and I'd uh, started publishing my fantasy series my first Australian fantasies and my agent sent it to him and this guy made me an offer for the first book in the series, but not books two and three. And my oh. agent and I had a long discussion about it and decided we wouldn't accept the offer. Because oh, no. we were sure we were sure we'd get another one for the three books. And we never did. Those books were mm. never published in England. I never got to work with that guy. I've kicked wow. myself ever since. So a failure of judgment, I guess, is a kind of oh, failure. Who's but... heard of Harry Potter, Sean? Yeah. <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> That's, That's right. like Alex's Wentworth story. <laughs> yeah. There's so many <laughs> sad stories. Isn't there? Alex yeah, says one. a lot of I got almost did this. Yeah, I almost did this, this and then and decided no. then decided for some reason I wouldn't do it. Um uh, yes, that was another misjudgment. I had a, a, a an actor friend who turned down a role with Sam Mendes in a stage production just before mm. American Beauty happened, and I think that oh. was another great one. But see the thing is with with all of this stuff is you've got to keep remembering I guess there is a ladder or a hierarchical structure, but it's so fluid and so complex constantly changing that you really don't know what you're turning down sometimes or that this opportunity to work with someone is as big as you 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 know you just you just don't know because that ladder is constantly changing and I think in hindsight you go gee that was a an obvious pathway I should have taken but in the moment it's not always as clear no, and then later, sometimes you, you also just have to trust your instincts too. Like but my instincts might, are you know, clearly terrible, Amy. Yeah, maybe you should do the opposite, like George Costanza. You should Costanza it. But you know, there are moments where people have given me advice that like you should do this, and I think, oh, I'm just going to stay on my path. And mm. you know, you don't know which way it would have gone, but we're no, glad and you're I, here. And you've got to you've got to run your own race as well. I think it's it's crucial to keep that in mind mm. that people around you will 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 have ups and downs. And you know, I think I might have said this in an earlier episode, but I had an an actor friend that got two of my actor friends became quite jealous of one another but one was a man in his mid 30s and one was a woman in her early 20s and I said you two are not ever going to go up it's not the same thing you're never going to go for the same job so if one of you has an opportunity you were never in it Mm. you you you, so you've got to run your own race and I think that's true of writing as well you're never going to um you know sometimes someone might have an amazing opportunity but you, you you have to look at it objectively and go I, I wasn't the right person no. for that. But in, your, you know? in my dream world, we'd all be successful all at once and we'd all drink the champagne together and be happy. But generally mm. your career is going up as someone else is going down or sideways or mm. and it will keep doing that. People go up and down and mm. up and down. Mm. I think the only failure that really worries me that really 
preys on my mind is where I where I have failed myself. It's the only failure yeah. that I have any control over. And, and 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 I'm not talking about that failure with the Harry Potter editor because you know I was working. It's easy to say in hindsight that that was. A but mistake, you might have but, got that three book deal, and then you wouldn't have regretted it. But where if I if I for whatever reason fail at a task because I haven't given it my all, haven't done the best I possibly could. That yes, that's the kind of failure that really. Yeah, I think for me, there's me. two on that line. One is um, I am afraid of inertia and laziness. Of uh-huh, like, yes. yeah, I'm me too. Not, not sitting down and writing the book. And I'm very mm. hard on myself. And I think I am very hard on myself during my pre-writing phase. Because like I keep saying, I think for me, the hardest bit is to the point where I sit down. Once I sit down and, and the ca- it's all right in my head, I'm very quick. Mm. But I can't have that quickness without the slowness beforehand. But I'm so hard on myself because I am scared I won't write, that I will just Mm. fall into a comfortable life and not ever write again. Maybe that would be fine, who knows. But the other one, I think, is... I've forgotten what the second one was. Well, can I just say that it wouldn't be fine for your readers if you just fell into a comfortable life well, and stopped writing not. because there'd be no more books by <laughs> Tesla Sue or Amy T. Matthews. What, what would we do? We'd have to read some other lesser author. Oh, I know terrible. what the other one is. The oh, other okay. one is that, um, that I would get my head turned by just the promise of publishing and not stay true to what I wanted. Mm. That I would just be like, okay, well, if I do these things, I will definitely get published and earn money and life will be comfortable. So I'll do that, but secretly feel like I'm not writing the things I really want to write. That's fair. Um, yes. And I think at a university, I will say this here, that I think, you know, universities put such pressure on us to publish hmm. and to be, you know, certain kinds of academics and they privilege certain work over other work that I think particularly if you're an academic writer, you, you run the risk of try- pleasing the academy and maybe selling yourself short. Well, I, I become very selfish in that regard. I will do a project if I want to do it, but I'm not going to jump onto everything just to hit a KPI or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, let me ask you this. I don't know if there's a version of this in, in the novel world, but one form of failure that can happen in performance writing is that there can be a production that you feel misrepresents your work and then it can be really successful. And, and I've been in this situation uh, where, where I'm the person who dislikes it, but everybody else is around me going, that's, that's fantastic, me. that's great. Yeah. And you go, oh, but it's not what I thought it was. How's that happened yeah, to you? Yeah, I've had that. Uh, well, actually it was a production Sean's story was involved in too. We, we, they turned short stories into stage <sighs> productions. Yes, I know and, what you're um, talking about. Yeah. yeah, and I wrote this short story called The Starving Dog, which was about, I don't know if you remember, this art installation in South uh, America. I hate that they, guy. Yeah, so they chained it. They took one of the street dogs that are starving. You know, they have a problem with dogs mm. running wild and they're not taken care of and they struggle to live. And they chained it up in an art gallery to starve in front of people. And you had to come and walk past the starving dog. And awful. come face to face with the problem in the city, but they let the dog starve. And um, so I wrote this short story about this guy who's obsessed with the starving dog, but is it actually a complete ass in his real life? Like treats the people around him terribly, is an abusive husband and father, is just like a nasty piece of work, but holds himself up as a moral person because he's trying to save this starving dog. Like he sits at his computer trying to save the starving dog, mm. but doesn't mm. look after his own people. So I wrote this story and sent it off and they performed it. And I sat there in the audience just, you know, when you go cold with horror? Yes. Because they'd flipped the genders and they'd made it the wife and mother who sits there ignoring her child and husband, obsessed about the starving dog. And the poor husband's running around going, why aren't you feeding your son? Why aren't you bathing your son? Mm. And I was just like, that's a whole different story. Yeah, discursively, that's a whole different story. That's that's saying a different thing. Get my name off it. Because yes. it had our names all on the thing and I was just like wanting to, because I'm a feminist too, and I just was like, I feel sick. Like, mm. I just feel sick. Mm. Sean's story was amazing. It was about these peeping toms. <laughs> Team that? Sharon was the name of <laughs> yeah. the story. They did such a great good. job. They, I was yeah. really pleased. Yeah. If, they <laughs> Sorry. Hadn't flipped the, if they hadn't flipped the genders, it would have been fine. But, but I was yeah. so embarrassed. I've never done it. I've never published the stories. I haven't done anything with it. Well, sometimes oh. people don't know that a decision like that 
has such an impact. I, I did a. They should a, have consulted. I thought they yeah. should have consulted us if they were making major changes. But like sometimes that. they don't even understand because I did a play uh, play about teenage pregnancy, and the best friend is an African woman who was written for this actor we had in the cast, and and so it's quite clearly an African woman from the dialogue. It's 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 not subtle because. She was lots of fun and we kind of pushed it further and further and we were playing with humour and irony and blah, blah, blah. And then a school did it and the school did it very well. I actually really enjoyed their production, but they didn't have an African in the cast. So they just kept the dialogue the same. Oh, no. And, I, and, I, and it was kind of comedic. I mean, on one level, I should have been in, in a similar position and, and, and perhaps offended or concerned. But part of me was just like, oh, wow, how did you, how did you miss that, guys? Because like, it really it, it reads as like nonsensical when it's a, a, a young white girl making all these jokes. At least they didn't do jokes. blackface. They At didn't do blackface, yeah, yeah. Which, is the, which is the other way it could have gone. <laughs> but it was a moment where I went, wow, I guess in your case, the reading of that is something quite horrific. Horrendous, whereas in my case, the reading was something that really didn't make any sense. So it, it was it was not as offensive as it could have been. But um, often I think people don't realise that those kinds of decisions are as pivotal as mm. as they are. You know, representation matters. But people, you know, you get in the middle of a rehearsal or you, you know, you get into the kind of the stress of the situation and you forget what should you be obvious. You go back to your defaults. You, yeah. you, mm. Like my... Um, when my Twin Maker series came out, trilogy of books, the main character is black, and uh, they, my my wonderful, fantastic, incredibly supportive and inclusive publisher, Alan and Unwin, produced these amazing covers that were nominated for awards. But while putting in the models, because they had real human figures on the covers, they were just uh, behind the pump, under the pump, whatever the expression is. They were really, really busy, and and all the the figures were white. And mm. I Ooh. emailed them and said, "This makes me uncomfortable. Can we do?" Anything about it and they you could tell that just no one had noticed because they were too busy um, and as soon as it was pointed out they were completely appalled and fixed everything straight away good on them but oh absolutely most, most publishers are great um and I, yes. they are all, all under the pump so often you do have to point it out that's um, right they are so under resourced and understaffed just like every other corporate industry absolutely they are that's right and the profit margins are so small there's no yeah. leeway for anything so and it must be hard for publishers because you know, speaking of failures, there are, there are really famous commercial failures of oh books my goodness, that have been so many paid millions of dollars for, and they've just completely tanked. And while yeah. a book that has come out of nowhere has become an international bestseller, yeah. it's such a crapshoot. It's yes. you can't. Yeah. There are fingers pointing all the time, laying blame on various people, but you you can't if you're going to stay sane actually ascribe blame under those circumstances mm. because it's no. so random. The dice are rolling and they fall where they will. So can I ask a question? You know, there's a lot of fear, I think, in the writing community about how many failures you can have before your career's huh. over. Yep. What do you reckon? Do you reckon that's a thing? What did well, Beckett say? Fail better? Isn't that the Beckett fail mantra? Better, that's right. Because I better. think you get, I've been told you get three shots and after that you kind of have to change your name. Depends how you define failure. You know, I, I, very few, when I was, as I was saying before, very few of my books have actually earned out, which I'm not ashamed to say. Can I just say I've just earned out for the first time in the last oh, year. First time in my whole career. Oh, it's a good feeling, isn't it? Yeah. You actually feel like you've earned your publisher money, but of course they started yeah. earning money ages before you earned out. Yeah. <laughs> so I've learned not to beat myself up too much about that. But I've had so many failures and... Um, I'm still here and they won't even let me change my name. I keep saying, oh, now surely I fade, failed badly enough now. It's time for a new persona. And they go, no, no, no. You can stay Sean Williams. But I don't want to stay Sean Williams. <laughs> but I He's think such your a failure. Failures, I think, though, your failures are probably not in terms of finances. They're nowhere near what like a literary fiction failure is. Like our sales, mm. even our poor sales are much, 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 much higher than... Oh, than kind of small no. literary fiction runs. Space opera in Australia. In fact, Brian Castro and I sat down and compared sales figures once and because uh, he was saying, oh, now science fiction sells so much more than literary fiction. I said, I actually don't think that's true. How many did you sell of your last book? And he said, oh, only like 2,000 copies or whatever. And I said, that's, that's about the same as I sold of my last space opera in Australia. It's astonishing how similar they are. Yeah. But romance is a different story, of course. Yeah. So, well, I guess I'm publishing most in the US. So yeah. like a small print run is like a bestseller here. The yeah. population is just so different. The numbers game. It's so right. hard to make number, like the numbers work in Australia. It's such a small population. Exactly. So stepping back, it seems that we're looking at failure in terms of 
technology, representation and finance. And personal and personal definition as mm. well. Like what what would what did you say, Alex? Like I I said inertia and not finishing a book. What's yours? I think the only real failure is when you See, I would rather, I'm not sure what the the headline to this is, but I would rather fail on what I intended to do than succeed on what someone else turned my work into. And I have had that experience a few times, like as I said. And so I I think the goal is always to try and be yourself and have your, your voice out there. And if you're doing that, I don't think you can necessarily go wrong. But in performance, there's so many layers that they can, all sorts of things can happen in that process. I've got one last question that we can end on, which is um, Stephen King says that everyone writes for an ideal reader, that Mm. there's always at least one person in your head that you're trying to impress. You want that one person to come away and go, yep, good one. Um, And for him, he says it's his wife, Tabby. Mm. So do you have an ideal reader that is in the back of your head? when you write and you just want that person to think well of you. Me. You. Yep. We could all choose Sean. It's, it's always yeah, Sean. It's Sean. <laughs> it's Sean. Sean Llewellyn Williams. <laughs> I think, uh, I love the name Llewellyn. I think... Um, of course, we're saying it wrong. We're all saying it wrong. How do you, how do you to say it? Llewellyn or... Oh, Llewellyn. Llewellyn. It's an unpronounceable name. Thanks, Dad. For well, if you do that. change your name, don't, yeah. Um, I... Uh, a bunch of high school kids came to see Once Upon a Midnight and this particular school found me afterwards. I actually don't know how that happened, but they kind of found me and asked me all these questions. And it was when they started pitching ideas for where those characters could go next, I thought, that's what you want. Yeah. I just You want a bunch yeah. of people to go... Now that imaginary person or world is in their head and they're being inventive with it. I think that's... Who's the... uh, uh, Not Stephen Moffat. Mark Gatiss, who Mm -hmm. was talking about his first Doctor Who episode where he wrote about the Gelf and said how bizarre it was to be on set when everyone's talking about the Gelf. This absolutely made up ridiculous thing in his head and suddenly there's a special effects guy talking about it and the script editors yeah, talking yeah. about it and I, I have moments like that where I go this absolutely stupid thing I had in my head is now written on all these call sheets or is, is now yeah. and I think that's the most so it's when your fantasy becomes other people's I think I found that in this last western series that so when I planned it I always knew that Death Rider would be the hero of the fourth book there's like so many books right Mm. and he sort of became like this fan favorite way Mm. before his book came along and people were asking when's his book coming and they were talking (laughs) about him and who the heroine would be and and it would be and like god i hope the heroine is this person that's turned up in this and it's just like that's so weird Mm. like it's such a strange thing that this person in my head is out there like you know you'd have people from louisiana commenting or people from there was a woman from poland who commented it's like that's surreal like that is so weird that i'm sitting here in my kitchen writing about these characters and people care (laughs) we're touching on an issue that we haven't really addressed directly and perhaps we'll save this for another audience uh, another episode i should say (laughs) another audience if you're listening now you can never return we want another yep. audience. He, think, he thinks you failed. <laughs> That's failing your audience, letting them down. <laughs> yes. Uh, whether it's by getting the details of some Star Wars detail wrong or mm. by writing yeah. a different book to the ones they expected. But let's not go there. This time, let's um, tantalise our Word Docs audience with promises of the future. Yep. Okay. So before we say goodbye, what are you going to do writing-wise in the next couple of days? Are you going to write something? Are you going to read something? Uh, you know, I, uh, gonna... I have to kill Harlow, my, my, uh, my villain oh. that I've been obsessed Obsessed oh. with, she has to lose somehow, and I, I've got to figure out. Unfortunately, she's too clever for me, and I, I've got to find a way to wrap this up and bring her down. I'm barracking for you, Harlow. <laughs> I'm going to finish writing this chapter I'm on. All right, so I'll see you guys next time. Yep. Happy writing, Alex. <laughs> 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 Until next time. Why don't you write when you don't need money? All your notes sound alike too much. All of them start with I love you, honey, but they end with the same old touch. Just for a change, send a nice loving letter and cut out that please remit. Why don't you write when you don't need money, honey? That would certainly make a hit. Stop clipping. Yeah. Clip his wings, Amy. I think it's that front one. (laughs) What?
I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> See how the trust relationship is broken that yeah. I didn't even believe it. That's yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.